The celebrations continue for West Indies cricket following their shock victory over Australia in the second and final test, which ended at the Gabba in Brisbane on Sunday. There are not enough plaudits that can be given to Shamar Joseph, who claimed 13 wickets in the series, including 7 for 68 in the second test victory. He also scored 57 runs in the series at an average of 28.70. Now, following Joseph's stunning debut series, the conversation now shifts to his future and how to best manage his workload for the best interest of West Indies cricket. Joseph has already signaled his dedication to the maroon colours, but one day after doing so, signed for Darren Sammy's former Pakistan Super League franchise, Peshwar Zalmi. The question is, how should the 24-year-old be managed going forward? Former West Indies fast bowler turned commentator Ian Bishop believes the Ghana Cricket Board, the Ghana government and corporate Caribbean all have a role to play in managing Shamar going forward. Bishop on the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, posted this. Important for the board, he said, Ghana government and corporate bodies to find a way to allocate funds to compensate Shamar Joseph and one or two other fast bowlers to keep them in the Caribbean and control how much cricket they play. Their pace is everything. Don't allow burnout. Now, Ian Bishop joins us now to discuss this story. Ian Raphael Bishop, great to have you on the Sportsmax Zone, sir. And um, I'm sure you're still... Um, celebrating the success of this West Indies team here and uh, the emergence of this terrific young fast bowler, Bish. Hello, Lance. I'm filled with trepidation because I'm hoping that you can hear me clearly. You know how technology messes up in points in time. But yeah, um, it's been a phenomenal against witnessing not just Shema, but the commitment of the entire West Indies team on that tour and the joy that they have brought to so many people. Yeah, well, Bish, the issue we are talking about now is Shamar Joseph and how he should be managed. We just presented your ex-publication there on, on your recommendations about what route should be taken to ensure that this young fast bowler doesn't suffer from burnout. I know your career, Bish, was stalled by a back injury, which many feel, many feel uh, prevented you from, you know, achieving even, even further heights in the game. Was the memory of that or is the memory of that a part of why you're feeling so close to this story? That's very kind of you, Lance. Um, I'll let you down softly and say no. Um, it had nothing to do with me and everything to, to do with the modern landscape of the game. Shema Joseph. But I, I want to clear up, or I want to stress that my social media posting was not only about Shema Joseph. I said a couple of fast bowlers, including Alzari Joseph and Jaden Seals, are primary objectives for me because Cricket West Indies cannot afford to pay or remunerate Shema Joseph, let's take that individual case, compared to what he can get out there playing in T20 leagues. And I understand that. If you understand where he came from, you will not begrudge him going there to make as much money as possible. But what I've seen, Lance, is a number of fast bowlers around the world who are playing all formats and then still going to play in the leagues because they have to secure their financial future. And I've seen the pace drop in several of what we call the premier fast bowlers in the world because of so much activity across formats. And I believe that in fast bowling, yes, quality is important, skill, but your pace allied with your skill is very important. And what the Australians do is that they protect Mitch Ma allow them to go and play elsewhere. Mm. I remember having a discussion with uh, the iconic Wesley Winfield Hall some time ago, um, Ian, and he did suggest that fast bowling as a sport, as, as, you know, 
is is effected is one of the most unnatural things in all of sport in the way that a fast bowler has to twist his body and 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 go through the motion of delivering delivering balls at you know 140 k's per hour and um I'm pretty certain that Wes Hall would agree with the point that you are making because of what fast bowling really is and how injury prone you can be if you're not careful in, in, in how you execute and the workload you give yourself. I'm sure you can speak on that as a former fast bowler yourself. Yeah, when my heavenly father, we always joke that when God made us, he didn't have fast bowling in mind, right? So it's a very, you're right, it's very strenuous. It's a very unnatural act. Um, but more than the injuries, yes, injury prevention is part of my concern. But particularly, as we're speaking about Shema, it about, it's about him being able to retain his pace because he's got great skill. People are talking about his pace, but look at the length that Shema has consistently bowled from the first game in Adelaide. Top of off is something that we've talked about, and he has displayed that from his first ball in Test cricket, which nicked off Steve Smith. So he's got the skill, but what you want him to do, and Alzari Joseph, and to a lesser extent, Jaden Seals, is to be able to blend that skill of swinging the ball and seaming the ball with the pace that they have to unsettle batters. And if you are playing high volume cricket across the world, that piece is going to drop. You're going to drop it either deliberately or it is going to come through wear and tear. And we have a great opportunity, Lance. A great, the number of people that have messaged me to say that two days ago they were in tears, grown men and women, and not just West Indians, but Australians, Englishmen, people from all corners of the world, Asia, that they cried watching West Indies and watching Shema Joseph put a team on his shoulders with one leg, bowled 12 overs on the trot, and each over was faster than the other one with excellent control. We cannot allow that to go by the wayside. You're a man who is really respected around the cricket fields and just in the cricket circles, right? You also, luckily, got the opportunity to interact with Shamar Joseph during these test series. He's somebody that has just announced himself on the scene and, of course, everybody is excited about him. Based on your interactions with him, do you think that he is of the personality and he's one of the players that would be open for protection. And yes, I heard him in the press conference saying he will always be available for test cricket. But you know better than everybody, once these players get a taste of the franchise money and how quick it happens, it's easy to, of course, be misleaded or it's easy to want that sort of money and recognition. Based on your interaction, what do you think? Will it be difficult to protect him? Um, I, I'll preface my answer by saying I'm not here to claim ownership of Shema Joseph. Shema's family back in Barakara, his small community, those in New Amsterdam and Budi and those in Ghana, his coaches, guys like Mario, who he's been friends with, um, from childhood, those are some of the people, Ryan Griffith and Leon Johnson, who are going to deserve him through and allowing him to express himself. Right? Let's get that clear. I'm not here to take ownership. But I've known <laughs> Shema before all of this that we saw in Australia. And I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about it. That's for Shema to talk about if he chooses to do so. But I've known Shema before that, when people didn't see the glory, and they didn't know the story. Um, and we talk about the possibility of Shema going to earn a living as though it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Shema has come from very, very humble beginnings, like Kevin Sinclair, like Romario Shepard, like Rockman Powell. And my heart is filled with joy 
when I see these guys have the opportunity to go and secure their financial future, because we can talk about West Indies colors, which is great to be loyal because that's the platform you started on. But at the end of the day, Shema has two little kids. He has a partner in Trish and they need to secure their home. They need to secure future schooling for those little ones. So, and we see what's going on in England, and England have a lot more resources and wealth than West Indies do, right? Australia and India. And England are talking about giving players multi-year central contracts, and their central contracts are so much bigger than ours. But they are very aware that people will come now and offer these players huge sums of money and so we also in the Caribbean, and that was the central part of my tweet, forgive me for prolonging it. We need to offer our players some sort of remuneration, whether it's multi-year contracts, and that is not falling on West Indies cricket alone, cricket West Indies. Johnny Grave gave a wonderful interview a few days ago about the challenges. I am saying the, His Excellency, President Ilfan Ali, is a lover of cricket and he's done so much for cricketers. Corporate Ghana, corporate West Indies, corporate Trinidad have to protect Shema, Alzari, Jaden Seals. I know people will say there are a few others. Those are the three guys that I've I'd identified. Multi year contracts and only allow them to go, let's say, to play in a league if we feel they need to supplement that a little bit or in Shema's case. And Jaden's case need to learn more about bowling and then come back to us. This time of leaving it to other people outside, West Indies cricket cannot afford that. Yeah, and Bish, I'm quoting you here, the pace is everything. Don't allow burnout. From your experience, can you just give us, give us some insight into where maybe you allowed yourself to burn out and if things were done differently back in your days? we would have seen an even better bish, which I don't know if it's possible, but let's just think about it. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't want to make this about me, Mariah. This is my time came and went. I chose to go to play county cricket. I had some imperfections in my bowling technique. And look, I have no regrets. My time is gone. My focus right now is in what I put out on social media. Let us attach mentors. We have Kirk Lee Ambrose, we have Courtney Walls, you have Kima Roach. You have guys you can attach to Shama, to Jaden Seals. That will, because there are going to be some potholes in the road ahead of these young men, this journey will not be smooth. And when they reach those bumps in the road, who will be there to guide, to encourage, and to nurture them through to fulfill their, to reach their full potential? I didn't reach my full potential. That's on me. I don't want to see the same thing happen to these guys. Do not leave it to chance. Yeah, Bish, you make an excellent point, and you Thanks. speak about the multi-year contracts, of course, we had the MOU signing in this studio just last week with Cricket West Indies and the West Indies Players Association. And as part of that memorandum of understanding um, is a clause for multi-year contracts. So clearly, both Cricket West Indies and the West Indies Players Association realize that this is where the game is going. And this is what needs to happen to protect many of our players. I want to get a better understanding from you, though, in terms of how you see your recommendation going. Who takes the lead? Is it Cricket West Indies? Is it the Guyana government, if we're talking specifically in the case of Ashamar, Hold, Ashamar Joseph? It is a, if it is another player, um, then we would talk about another local board or another um, government. But who do you see or who do you think should take the lead on this? I would assume, I, I would say, and I don't operate at that level, but from 
where I, I sit, Cricket West Indies would be the ones taking the lead in this scenario. But it's time for, you know, our leaders of and heads of the various territories discuss a lot. They're good people, very, very good people, I am sure. But now is a time, and let us strike while the iron is hot. 27 years it took us from 97 when myself and Carl Hooper and Brian Lara, by the way, this win, I have never seen Carl Hooper and Brian Lara so excited. And we've been through some battles together. I've never seen two gentlemen who are the epitome of cool, so excited and emotionally moved by this victory. I just want to get that out of the way. So that's what it means. It's time for leaders. And again, I'll say, for example, his Excellency, President of the Repu People's Cooperative Republic of Ghana, loves cricket. He loves those cricketers. He helps them a lot. This is another time where they need to contribute. The corporate entities around the Caribbean need to put their hand up because you see what this game means to Caribbean people. We are reminded once again, like no other time, that we need to partner with Cricket West Indies and get these young men to reach the epitome of their potential. And that's across formats. That's not just test cricket. I love test cricket. Yeah. But I also understand test cricket is not sacrosanct. There's a generation that were born after 1995. Most of them only know T20 cricket as the epitome. So let's not sideline them and think T20 cricket is not cricket. I disagree with that. But we're talking test cricket and its resurgence. Yeah, very much the case. We've been discussing a lot about franchise cricket and how it could potentially impact um, someone like Ashamar Joseph. Of course, news coming through today that he has withdrawn from the ILT20 tournament, um, which he had signed for late last year. And uh, no, he will not be involved in that because of the toe injury. But I want to discuss about his West Indies future and his future outside of test cricket and in colored clothing. Would you, Ian Bishop, recommend Shamar Joseph for limited overs cricket, both the 50 over and the T20 format? Definitely. I don't, I don't, I don't even need to deliberate that. At some point, he's going to play white ball cricket for the West Indies. Um, just his, his sheer pace, his, his control, and he will learn about the different skills required. I don't know how Shamar Joseph was not selected for a CPL team. And I've known Shamar before the CPL took place. I, I really don't know. Um, so that's another thing. Our scouting around certain teams in the Caribbean needs to be better. There's a young lad. When I first saw Shema bowling, there was a young lad bowling alongside him called Silas Tindall. He is also from the beast. He cannot get into a Ghana team. But I know that watching Silas, there's talent. But he's a poor kid. He comes from humble backgrounds. But who is dragging the net to put Silas on a fast bowling program, for example? I'm just calling that name. There are others around the region. Right? Are we serious about maximizing talent? Um, Mariah asked me a question and I forgot to answer it. Shema is the most humble, hardworking youth that you could ever come across. And his batting in that first test match, Mariah, yeah. his bravery in coming out and charging Mitchell Cecilwood and Pat Cummins after he was struck on the helmet tells you something about his character. He is afraid of no one, and he will back down from no one. And so when that young man put the team on his shoulders and ran in on one leg and won the test match for the West Indies, that is who Shama is. And those are the things that we have to protect. Mm. But again, I'll say that the young man that I call, who is going to... I called around one or two teams in the Caribbean and asked for that young kid to show his ways to them. I called the people running the academy, those running the CCC, to give, try to give this young kid a break. 
and there was always some roadblock, for example. He's a friend of Kevin Sinclair. Kevin is trying his best to help him. But you know what? We won't help him until he reaches somewhere in the spotlight, and then everybody will pile on to try to help him. We need to be better in the Caribbean at, at pro Remind us of his name, Until people reach a stage and become a... Silas Tinno. We can't wait for people to become superstars and then jump on the back and have I'm not saying that, for example, that kid is going to play for West Indies. But at least we need to find out whether he has a chance to play, for example, for Guyana. Mm. I mean, Lance, this, these things get me a little emotional. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We, our, so, we, yeah, but again, we, I thank Johnny Gray for putting what he put out there. All right, Bish, we're going to leave it there, but I just want to get a confirmation from you um, quickly before we go. It is my understanding that Shamar Joseph's agent is an Australian woman. Can you confirm that? And is that is is there any way that you know discussions with her would 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 address some of the issues that we have? I don't know. Her origin, last um, I know of her, I know of the company. But that's, again, the agent has own um, scope that they look after, and the best agents look after that financial business, but also the player's welfare. So everything here has to be Alzari, Jaden, and Sh working in collaboration between their agents and the board for the good of the individual first, and then for West Indies cricket. All right, Bish, uh, great talking to you here, getting some insight from you as uh, someone not only close to the game because of your history of playing the game, but as a top commentator at the moment, and clearly um, maintaining a close association with these players, which is very important. Let us, from the Sportsmax Zone, congratulate you, Bish, on the fabulous job that you've been doing, and we hope to talk again soon. Yeah, I know we've been having a bit of a delay here on, mm -hmm. on the conversation with But Bish. it was so worth it. <laughs> but, but it was worth it. We'll be back with more on The Zone after this. Yeah.